Hey, I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment to thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 32 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 032. Well, folks, we just got through the elections, and unfortunately, I don't have my show notes in front of me. Just a quick update. What happened is my internet's been down all day. And, well, I usually start the development of my show notes on a computer, which I have that computer in front of me. I have the, like, third or fourth revision of the show notes, and they're woefully incomplete. Now, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the gun of the show. Now, for this gun of the show, I figure, well, let's go with something a little different. We've talked about semi-autos, we've talked about revolvers, and, well, you know what? I decided to stay on the pistol thing, kinda, and I thought we'll talk about a Rossi Ranch Hand instead. Now, the Rossi Ranch Hand is the clone, I guess that's the way you'd put it, the Rossi Ranch Hand is a clone of Steve McQueen's Mare leg, Mare's Leg rifle from Wanted Dead or Alive. Actually, it's not a the Mare's Leg that's sold by Rossi is not a rifle, but the one in the movie was, or not a movie in the TV show. Oh man! So let's talk about that just a minute. You see, the Gun Control Act of 1934, I believe, established that. Rifles under a certain length with a barrel less than 16 inches and, uh, you know, a number of little features. Anything that was short enough it could be concealed was illegal without a tax stamp. This is the same law that did the same thing to machine guns. Well, to film the movie, ov- or not movie, to film the TV show, they obviously had to be legal, so they paid the stamp and made a mare's leg out of a Winchester rifle. Mine comes to life as a pistol, though. The receiver has never been assembled as a rifle, so it's legal for them to put the shorter stuff on it and call it a pistol. In fact, there's actually a warning label attached to the hoops that says, uh, let me grab the gun. Warning says, attention dealer, receive and sell as a handgun. That's all the wording that's on the tag. And yes, I have retained that tag because... You never can tell when somebody's going to, hey, that's an illegal rifle. Let me see the paperwork on it. I retain that tag. That way there's, you know, if somebody really wants to be a pain in the neck about it, they can still cause you problems. But at least with that, you can avoid a lot. Now, mine, I I purchased mine because I saw it at the gun store. My buddy showed it to me. He goes, don't you like it? I told him, yeah, I like it. And I was thinking, I remember watching one of those on TV as a kid. And then I thought, and I remember seeing that on Firefly too. And it goes on from there. Just off the top of my head, I thought thought of two or three different TV shows I'd seen the gun on. But as a kid, I remember watching it on a black and white western. As I mentioned before, it was called Wanted Dead or Alive. It starred Steve McQueen as Josh Randall, a bounty hunter. Now, before you go and think I grew up in the days of black and white TV, let me tell you that is not the case. I remember watching the reruns and asking my dad why the TV was broke. And the reason I was asking why it was broke is there was no color, just black and white. Now, as a hunting or a defensive firearm, mine's relatively useless unless you're putting it right up against the target because, well, it's got a bit of a kick. Basically, you do not use this thing to shoot accurately. Well, maybe you do in the lesser calibers, but with mine, you don't. You see, mine is chambered in the 44 Magnum. And I guess I could load up some reduced power cartridges and I could probably shoot it accurately without risking the thing coming back and hit me in the face or the discomfort of the hoop hitting my finger. And it doesn't even hit my finger because I'm snug up against it, but it still hurts. It has a weird recall impulse. However, you know what? I think you're tired of hearing me talk about how this is just a gun you shoot for fun. Because that's why you shoot it. You go out there, you shoot this thing because it's fun, it's different, and it starts conversations. So you know what? Let's give you some specs and then we'll move on with the show. The model on this one is RH92-50121. Caliber is the 44 mag. Capacity, six shots. It's a lever action. The sights consist of a gold bead front sight with an adjustable buckhorn rear sight. Material is steel and wood. Weight comes in at four pounds, probably the heaviest handgun we've talked about on here. And by probably, I mean definitely. And the MSRP, when this was recorded, 
was $596.82. Now, like I said, MSRP is always a little high. You can 99% of the time you can find it for cheaper than MSRP. Now then, we got that done. We're through talking about the gun of the show, so let's play the little audio clip on how to get the show. And someday I will update that to include YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, after we come back from this, I will talk a little bit about some of the changes that we have on the YouTube channel after I discuss some listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, and in the Microsoft Windows podcast store. Of course, you can always download the show and see the show notes as well as comment by going to the website gunrightsintexas.com. Now then, I've had a number of listeners want to link to the article I mentioned in episode 31 with a picture of the guy wearing two pistols on the same side thinking I was actually exaggerating the derp as I recall a number of them put it. So in the show notes for this episode, you will find a link to the article on salon.com with the full derp. Now, I did also have another uh, listener or two email me a comment that I didn't exactly, well, I didn't exactly describe it because as, uh, let's see here, I'm looking through email and Larry, Larry is the one that said, If this idiot had to draw his lower firearm, he would be muzzling himself with the upper one. If he drew his upper firearm and somehow caused it to discharge, it would strike the second firearm and would probably end up hurting him with uh, pieces of lead, copper, and maybe even, even pieces of his second firearm. But some people said I was actually exaggerating the derp, as I put it or as a number of them put it, and some of them said I wasn't describing it well enough. Now, Larry, he kind of he kind of was irritated by it to a point that if I read you his email, I would have to bleep out a lot of it. And Larry's actually a very vocal, open carry supporter. His thing is, don't do stupid stuff. That's actually the signature in his email. He's emailed me a number of times. He's always been polite. He's always been a very well-spoken advocate for open carry. It's just this here fully irritates him because it shows stupidity. Now, personally, I feel that this, uh, I feel what I described the last time was probably the most politically sensitive way to describe it. So go to the show notes and right there at the start of the show, there's going to be a listener feedback link and there'll be a, it'll take you to salon.com where you can see the picture and the article and read the article. Now, the article is very biased and is a blatant attack on gun rights. Now then, moving on to the YouTube page, or the YouTube channel. Well, I've actually done some work on the YouTube channel this week. I can't exactly go and look at it and tell you what all I've done. That's because my internet is still down. If my internet comes up, you'll get a much better quality show. However, when you go to the YouTube channel, if you're not subscribed to it, there'll be a little uh, trailer video play. And you'll see the, um, (laughs) what's the best way to describe them? There's a playlist of the videos at the uh, bottom of the YouTube channel page. Starts with the most recent episode and it goes uh, backwards from there. So like this is episode 32 and it's on there when you're hearing this. Episode 31 is the next one. Episode 30 is the one after that and so on. Now then, for for this podcast, you know, I'm, I've been talking about there's going to be a YouTube exclusive content and we're going to experiment with it. We're going to try new things. And this episode may or may not be an example of that. It depends on if my Internet comes up in time for me to pull down the video, or pull down the photos I want to use in the show notes. You know what? We'll go ahead and do that because I do have I do have screen captures I will use even if my Internet doesn't come up. So this one will have additional pictures in the YouTube video. There'll be screen caps, not motion screen caps, but stills. Now with that said, let me play the social media audio and we'll be back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on social media. 
Links to all the social media profiles can be found on the website. On Twitter, the podcast is at GunRightsNTX. On Facebook and Google+, Plus, it is GunRightsInTexas. So please, be social. So let's talk about the topic. Topic on this episode is what everybody else in podcasting and the media is talking about this week. And that is decision 2014. The election has come. It's been voted. Uh, The decisions have been made for the most part. There, There may be a few runoff elections here or there, but for the most part, all the decisions that matter are in. And to my knowledge, none of the decisions in Texas really warrant a runoff election. However, just looking at it, let me say, I'm a gun owner and I voted. I hope you can say the same thing. Now then, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, political fallout. I'm using an older version of my show notes here still, so I don't have all the information I wanted to touch on in my outline. But in order to talk about the elections, well, we really need to look at what was said and done in the run-up to the elections. On that note, let's start with Open Carry Texas. Now, these guys enjoy playing fast and loose with their game, and they really don't mind if they hurt their own position in the process. So let's start off with OCT's legislative goals in 2014, or at least what they posted in 2014 for 2015. Now, they posted these goals to Facebook, and if you're watching the YouTube video, you can see the screen caps on them on the screen starting right about now. In fact, I I think I'd like to have them up earlier than that. So... We're going to talk about these as I go through and read them, because I'm not going to read them off and just bore you with that. Their first legislative goal is repeal laws that infringe on our right to keep and bear arms, colon, constitutional carry. Now, this is a good idea, but I think it'll take more time and effort than they realize. In the short term, I'm going to say that goal can be met with licensed open carry initially, followed by removing restrictions and requirements in the future legislative sessions until we get to the point where we have unrestricted and unlicensed carry with, as they put it, optional or voluntary CHL. Which leads us into the second of their legislative goals for 2015, which is voluntary concealed handgun licenses. Now, this is voluntary CHL with disqualifiers only limited to crimes in which guns were used and violent crimes. Well, when you get right down to it, technically the CHL is already voluntary, but if a gun used in a crime, isn't it already a violent crime? I don't know about you, but for most prosecutor, for most prosecutors and prosecutorial standards, if a gun is used in the process of committing that crime, it's treated as a violent crime. Now, I really doubt they will get all the disqualifiers removed if they even make any headway on this. And the reason for that is Class A and Class B misdemeanor convictions can be used to show a lack of judgment. It's not fair that it disqualifies you for five years. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think you should lose your right to carry over a misdemeanor. I really don't. However, our politicians probably won't be changing that anytime in the near future. I'm sorry. The next one they have, which is their third uh, political goal, is the, to reduce the cost of the CHL to $20. That would be nice. I don't see it happening, but it would be nice. And it's not because the CHL is somehow mandated by law to be, that, uh, to be the $140 that's required by the state. I think $140 is the upper limit that's set by statute. You could really get a lot more work done on reducing the cost of the CHL by... Having one-on-one dialogues with the DPS, I believe. Talk to the DPS. I think they are the ones that actually set the price and go down from there. But I will say, I really do believe that they had a a budget surplus on the concealed handgun license. The next one is to clarify the disorderly conduct law to protect regular law-abiding gun owners. And you know what? That's a good idea. In fact, it's such a good idea, I suspect that the TSRA is working on this very same goal for 2015. And by the using the word suspect, I mean, I know they're working on that goal for 2015. You don't believe me? Charles Cotton has mentioned as much on uh, the Texas CHL forum. Now then, their fifth, uh, yes, that's uh, the last one was their fourth legislative goal. 
The fifth legislative goal is increasing the penalty for making a false 911 call. If someone is shot or killed as a result, the caller is charged with felony manslaughter. Well, (sighs) you know, this is kind of a tough one to chew on. I suspect the argument that this would have a chilling effect on real emergency calls would be used to effectively kill a bill that does this. However, I'm going to encourage them to go ahead and try it. Maybe they'll make headway. But I really think you're going to be more or less better off holding a prosecutor's feet to the fire in such a case. Oh well, moving on. Their sixth legislative goal for the 2015 session is to hold police officers accountable for shooting law-abiding gun owners or violating their rights to carry or right to carry without justification. Hmm... Okay, if an officer shoots someone without a legal basis, they face criminal charges already. And there's also the possibility they'll they'll face uh, civil charges as well. Now, if an officer violates someone's right to carry without justification, they can face criminal and or civil penalties, depending on the nature of the violation. Now, I am going to say the latter probably should be improved. However, it should be done so carefully. Their seventh legislative goal is abolish the TABC code sections as they relate to the possession of legal firearms on the premises of TABC license holders. It's not a bad idea. However, I think it's going to be a very difficult one to pass in all honesty. I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're probably going to have an easier time passing a bill to have unlicensed carry and at the same time passing a bill to eliminate the front license plate on a motor vehicle. You'll probably have an easier time passing both those bills than to pass a bill doing this. However, if you break it up into little pieces, spread it out over several legislative sessions, you can get it done without having too much of a hassle and without it really drawing too much attention from the opposing side. Now, the eighth legislative goal is kind of a crazy talk thing. And that is state nullification of the Federal Gun-Free School Zone Act that places an unconstitutional thousand-foot bubble around schools. Now, states can quali- states cannot nullify a federal law, but federal courts can. The Gun-Free School Zones Act we got now was struck down, uh, was not struck down, but was put in place after the previous version was struck down. Word for word, they're almost identical. However, this one justifies itself by uh, by basically raising the specter of the Commerce Clause. Now, their ninth legislative goal is something that's, uh, well, it's something that I've mentioned myself in a way. Maybe not quite the same level that they're taking it to, but I've mentioned I want this as well. And that is strengthening the preemption law. Now, their actual goal is strengthening preemption law and make it applicable to state agencies as well as municipalities. Now, I'm going to agree. Strengthening the preemption law is needed. However, I would like penalties for posting unenforceable signs or preemption violations by government bodies. But I will take any improvement we can get to the preemption law. The problem is you start messing with the preemption law and you're opening it up to hostile amendments. And I can already guarantee we're going to be fighting off uh, bills to ban the long gun open carry. We're going to be fighting off a lot of different anti-gun bills that have, they're going to ha- they're going to be using open carry Texas as examples to support their legislation to restrict our rights. And if you open up preemption to a potentially hostile amendment, you're going to face the bitter pill of killing your bill lest you swallow a poison pill. Now, their 10th legislative goal is pass open, or not open, pass campus carry legislation. This is a great idea, too. Kind of like their fourth legislative goal. In fact, it's such a great idea, I suspect the TSRA is already working on this one as well. And like on number four, by suspect, I mean I know. However, let's kind of hold this particular legislative goal uh, let's keep this one in mind for later because we're going to come back and touch on it. OCT kind of <clears throat> made a statement on this particular subject that, well, I want to touch on. Number 11, 
on their list of legislative goals is lower the age to possess a firearm and obtain a CHL to 18 years of age or 18 years old. Well, we're already more than halfway there. You see, Texas law allows for 18-year-olds to purchase and possess handguns as well as long guns. The problem we run into is federal law, which limits the purchase of handguns from federal firearms license holders to those who are 21 and older. So if you want to go buy a rifle or a shotgun from an FFL, you can be 18 or older and buy it. If you want to go buy a handgun from an FFL, you have to be 21. If you see a handgun or a rifle for sale or a shotgun for sale, uh, say, in the Thrifty Nickel, you call the guy up, yeah, I'm. Uh, he's willing to sell it, you want to buy it, you got the money, he's got the gun, you meet up, you're 18, you're good to go. So basically, the purchase requirement is already there. Now, OCT can claim victory on getting the getting that, but they really didn't. Because that's been the law since the, well, as long as I can remember. What they really need to do is they need to make a move on the national level to reduce the purchase age requirement on handguns under federal law. When they do that, they have done something. But let's move on to reducing the age for the CHL. In a way that's already a partial case, you see, the concealed handgun license is available to 18-year-olds if they're in the military or if they're honorably discharged from the military. Everybody else that's not military has to be 21, unfortunately, or 21 or older. So there's some work they can do there. I won't, I'll be honest, I'm not going to fight most of this that they've talked about so far or most of this that they've posted. A few things I think could be done better than what they're suggesting. Some of it is, uh, well, kind of, well, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. Some of it's a pipe dream, okay? But let's move on to number 12. And legislative goal number 12 is remove exemptions that allow politicians, attorneys, off-duty police officers, and other state employees to legally carry a firearm where other law-abiding citizens cannot. Rather than restrict people further by removing exemptions, Why not open those exemptions up? Or even better, just remove the restriction altogether. Now that makes a lot more sense. And number 13 of OCT's legislative goals, pass a law that makes the shooting of an unarmed citizen or animal by a police officer a crime subject to the same charges any other citizen would face for doing the same. Okay, we got to be careful with this one. In fact, can we find where in the law the police have an exemption ex- uh, blah, an exemption that any other citizen lacks? I don't know about you, but I, I don't know of no such exemption. And to be perfectly honest, I tend to look at things in a far more detail than Open Carry Texas does. And I'm basing that off personal observation. But now that we've covered their goals, we need to cover what they have said they will do if they don't get their way. Now, the first thing I want to mention, and on the YouTube video, it should be coming up about now. OCT has said if Texas does not pass unlicensed carry, they will sue the state. And, uh, well, I'm not exactly sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not exactly sure what the basis for that suit will be. But one must remember the courts are very unpredictable. And oftentimes, nothing goes according to plan for either side. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say the next YouTube screen cap should be up now, and it should be showing where OCT has threatened, and I will quote, If we don't get open carry next year, we will run a candidate in every district that voted against it or stood in the way. Personally, this kind of concerns me because I am unsure what they will consider as standing in the way of open carry. Will it be something as insane as missing the vote because the uh because the candidate they're going to be running somebody against was in the hospital? Or would it possibly be more like somebody being on a committee that the bill was assigned to but didn't make it out of, even if they did sponsor the bill? Another serious consideration OT or OCT needs to take into account is that, well, they could not help the incumbent who introduced an OC bill in the House twice win his primary election. How the heck do they intend to run as many candidates as they're saying they're going to be able to run and hope to win? It's all posturing. 
It's all grandstanding. And unfortunately, it hurts their position. I'll be honest, I would love to see them succeed. Because while their methods may leave something to be desired, their goals, well, I like their goals for the most part. Maybe not the way they're wanting to go about their goals, but for the most part, their goals are pretty good. Now, the third item I want to touch on with Open Carry Texas and their political temper tantrum is that, well, they decided that Texas State Senator Birdwell from Senate District 22 is not pro-gun, and they call for their followers to send him packing. <laughs> and I'm kind of I'm kind of amused by this one. Now, the basis for this decision is because he refuses or he refuses to support unlicensed carry legislation. Now, in all honesty, I suspect they approached him about sponsoring their bill and he refused. I don't know that for a fact. I haven't heard that from anybody. But considering that they're on uh, their podcast, apparently they're supposed to be ready to announce who's going to be sponsoring their bill. I'm going to go out on a limb and say they were shopping around. They approached him, he refused them, and they decided to threaten him in retaliation. But you know what? We need to go back to item number 10 on their political goals, which is campus carry. And you remember they said they want to pass campus carry in the next legislative session? Does anybody remember who introduced it in the 2013 session? On the Senate side, it was Senator Birdwell. Hmm, how about that? One of their legislative goals for 2015 was introduced by an anti-gun politician, if you listen to them. Hmm, that does not make sense. Either the politician is actually pro-gun, or Open Carry Texas is just attacking people for not agreeing with them. My money's on the latter. Now, another interesting note is that if you tell people that you want to send somebody packing... Basically, you're telling them to vote against him. And when you do it the week or a week before, the week of or the week before elections, uh, you're kind of hinting that that person's up for re-election. However, I doubt Open Carry Texas realizes that Senator Birdwell is not, for, is not up for re-election until 2016. And we're going to use that to segue into the next organization we need to talk about. And that is... Uh, Open Carry Tarrant County. Now, Corey Watkins, the president of Open Carry Tarrant County, posted to Senator Birdwell's page. Apparently, he keeps tabs on what OCT says and does. And he went to Birdwell's page and he posted the following statement. And I quote, I heard you don't support constitutional carry. It's the number one priority on the Republican platform. I know that's something you never read, but you might want to start. Enjoy your last few years as a... Elected official, the revolution is here, end quote. All right, this is one that, it takes a crazy talk to a whole new level. <laughs> um, ooh, man, this is, this one's kind of out there. Somebody could actually take that as a physical threat, and some people might. But I'm reading that as, we're going to, we're going to put you out of work. And while, while Open Carry Texas may be bigger I don't think Open Carry Texas has the ability to run somebody successfully against Birdwell, and I really don't think they could swing anybody against him themselves. Add into that, Open Carry Tarrant County, they're quite a bit smaller than uh, Open Carry Texas. And to be perfectly honest, I really don't think Open Carry Tarrant County can do jack, at least outside of their political district. Now, I do have to throw props out to Open Carry Tarrant County. Um, you know, they're kind of in a running feud with the city of Arlington over their uh, ordinance relating to the handing out of literature. And that's, an, well, that's another story for another time. And we have covered that, and I have thrown them out props on that before. However, I'm going to play the uh, next audio clip because, you know what, I don't have news. And uh, I want to... I want to play the next audio clip. Then I'm going to talk about the results of the election and afterwards. So please stand by and the show's nowhere near being over. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, 
then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All righty. So let's take a look at the results and what's happened after the election. And we're going to look at what this means for gun rights as well. Now, in regards to the executive branch elections, pretty much every candidate that the TSRA endorsed won. Now, the positions that were up for grabs were the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller of public accounts, general land office, and the agriculture commissioner. Oh, and I forgot the railroad commissioner, too. When it comes to the Senate, I want to say all the TSRA endorsed candidates won their elections. I'm not sure about that. That's actually in my other show notes. <laughs> the ones that are online that I do not have internet access for. But I want to say they all, all the senators that the, that the TSRA endorsed won. Now, when it comes to the House, I want to say a wide majority of those endorsed by the TSRA won. In fact, it may be like five or six that didn't. This means that the TSRA has a lot of stroke in the state Senate, and they have slightly less stroke in the House, but in the executive branch, they're pretty much dominating it. Now, I do want to say that the candidates that received an NR, uh, TSRA endorsement, they have a rating of A+, plus, A, or AQ. Now, the AQ rating means the rating is based on the questionnaire results. This person has no voting record that they can go back and look at and say, okay, this is how he voted on gun rights issues. All they can do is they can say, he answered the questionnaire. He said what we wanted him to say. We're going to give him an A rating, but we're qualifying it as being based on the questionnaire. Now, if a race had only an A minus or lower rating candidate, there were no, T uh, there were no endorsements from the TSRA in that race. So let's say you have a race between an A-minus candidate and a F candidate. The TSRA did not endorse anybody. They would prefer you vote for the A-minus candidate, but they're not going to endorse somebody that has actually stood against their legislation. Now, since the election, Greg Abbott has already come out and made a statement that he would sign an open carry bill if it makes it to his desk. This is met with both cheers and jeers from the open carry advocates, you know, these folks are cheering that he will sign it, and at the same time, they're attacking him for qualifying that it has to make it to his desk. Now, what the open carry advocates do not understand is that as governor, he has to use his political capital on a lot more issues than gun rights. He has to use political capital to push his uh, positions on education, job creation, taxes, energy, and others. Now, Open Carry Texas initially started out calling for its members to hold Greg Abbott's feet to the fire on this issue and has promised to support Open Carry. However, they reworded it as a promise to support constitutional carry, and they have since made statements indicating they understand he supports Open Carry. When Greg Abbott made a statement after the election, OCT made comments that he should do more than promise to sign it if it makes it to his desk. I believe the actual demands were that he should push the legislature to get constitutional carry to his desk. And I believe this was actually said on their podcast and on their Facebook page. But you know what? That's enough of talking about OCT. Let's move on and talk to talk about the TSRA in more detail. Now, in the run-up for the election, the TSRA was relatively quiet outside of sending out their endorsements and their reminders to vote. Now, after election day, they are every bit as quiet as you would expect a mime to be in church. In the 48 hours after the election, there have been no emails regarding the candidates, the positions, victories, defeats, or even the issues. On the Facebook page, the TSRA is running 100% like normal. They're not going out of their way to mention a candidate or an issue. They're just throwing out links to news stories and events and things like that. It's just business like usual with their Facebook page. So why is there a lack of noise from the TSRA? Well. People really don't know for sure because the TSR is kind of playing, likes to play things close to their vest, just as anybody with political experience does. But I'm certain that it's because they are too busy finalizing things such as who is sponsoring which bill. They're talking to the lieutenant governor about who will be on which Senate committee. And they're trying to find out exactly where every winner in the election stands on their issues without giving too much information about everything they're going to do. After all, if somebody's going to be opposed to an issue that you're really going to push, 
You don't want to give them a heads up so that they can share it with everybody else that you're going to be pushing this issue. So basically, my theory is the TSRA is uh, busy getting everything they could not do prior to the election done so that they have all their ducks in a row. They can go in, they can mow down the competition and get their bills through as easily as possible, expending as little political capital as possible. Now, with that said, gun rights efforts in 2015 look pretty good. Now, we have to ensure that people do not go so far as to antagonize our representatives and our senators on the issues that we are pushing. However, we need to make sure that these senators and these uh, representatives are very much aware that this is our position on these issues. And if you want to know where to go in order to learn about the issues and to learn when to put pressure on and when to take it off, because the ability to take the pressure off is probably more important than the ability to put the pressure on. It's kind of like somebody with a a severe laceration or puncture wound. If applying the pressure is important, but in order to get the wound repaired, you got to know when to take the pressure off so that the surgeon can go in and fix the wound. And in politics, it's a lot like that. You know, you may have your, let's say the TSRA, they send out a notification. Call your representatives, call your senators, let them know that they need to support Bill XYZ. People start calling the senators, okay, okay, we're going to support it. Just get your people to back off. We need to get phone calls on other things through the switchboards, and they're jammed right now with your people calling. So the TSRA sends out another email. Okay, it's done. Uh, You don't have to call them anymore. Uh, Just stand back, and let's see what happens, and be ready to call again if we need you to. And people quit calling. And now these representatives realize, hey, these people know how to run their constituents. They have that much control over what these constituents are going to do. And a lot of their constituents are our constituents. And they increase their political capital because now the politician realizes they make them mad. That kind of power can be brought against them in an election. So my advice is to go to the TSRA PAC website. And that is TSRAPAC.com. No spaces, no dashes, all one solid word. TSRAPAC.com and click on the sign up for emails or email alerts, fill it out, click submit, and start getting the email alerts from the TSRA. If you're not a member, join them. If you're not a member of the NRA, join them too. But by signing up for the email alerts, you're going to ensure that you get the latest updates from the TSRA. And I strongly recommend that if you're really interested in Texas politics, go out there, sign up for the email alerts on any other organization that's involved that offers them. And when you do, well, pay attention to what they're saying. Look at the issues and ask yourself, is this really the issue that, or the position I want on this issue? Or is this going to do more harm than good to the legislative efforts? But when you sign up for email alerts from all these organizations, my advice is listen to the TSRA's recommendations more than you do the others, at least for Texas politics. TSRA has been doing this for years. They've got a proven track record. They know what they're doing, and they can get stuff done. Nobody else has the ability to say, I can do it. Here's my history. Here's what I've done. Because nobody else has that history. Nobody else has that experience. They may, in the next session after 2015, which would be 2017, they may be able to go back and say, this is what I can do. This is what I've done. But right now, the TSRA is the only one that can say that. So please, keep in mind what the TSRA says when you take and make political action. Or when you take political action. Good grief. This is why I don't like to use old show notes that are several revisions out of date. Because that was not good. Now, like I said, I don't have any news in this episode. I have one story that I started to put down in the show notes. And then I uploaded them to the uh, Google Drive account where I can edit them at will on multiple devices. And view them on multiple devices if the batteries are not dead. However, the only thing I have on this particular story is the first name of Dana. I don't know if we're talking about a Dana differential in a Jeep, uh, a Dana news personality, or a Dana political personality, or what. It's just D-A-N-A, Dana, and that's it. (laughs) So that's all the news and information we have on news. 
And unfortunately, I'm not going to do a new to guns in Texas this episode because, well, I don't have it in front of me. It's in the other show notes, but I'm still offline. I cannot get internet access. And my cell phone is in another room charging. Because when I turn that thing on, it's going to make a lot of noise. And we don't want that. Not while we're recording the podcast. So with that said, stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.